Um, all right, so we'll call the meeting to order. Um, what was it, 4.32? We'll start with a roll call. Sure. Um, Councillor Dwight. I'm here. Councillor Foster. Here. Member Baskin. Here. And Member Simon. Here. Uh, do we announce uh, guests, for example, that the council president is here or? I'm here for public comments. Wonderful. And that's the next item on the agenda. So we will open public comment. Any member of the public? That would be you. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to, you know, based on what's on your agenda this evening, I just wanted to uh, give some thoughts. Um, so this is to the item about reinstating an end time to meetings. So first I want to start off by saying that I, one thing I really appreciate about the council agendas are that they are expected to be completed and they're not aspirational agendas, um, which I see uh, in other committees sometimes. So we very rarely push things off. And if we do, it's usually for a reason, like we need more information. Um, and it's not because we're not treating each item equally as important to accomplish for, for that meeting. Um, additionally, I also think it's within the spirit of open meeting law that we address the items that are posted on the agenda. Um, but since you are discussing um, a recommendation about reinstating an end time, um, I just thought there are a few more things that I, I would ask you consider. Um, and one would be that if that was gonna be a recommendation that you also consider having a recommendation for an, um, a standing extra meeting for overflow, um, which like we did with the budget season this year, um, you would have to figure out a date and time that would work with all the other standing meetings that happen. But uh, I think it's something that would be important to consider. Um, it also, it would require a lot more coordination and communication between the council president um, and Laura and primarily the mayor's office and planning, but all of the departments, um, you know, because if all items are not going to be reached on an, could potentially not be reached on an agenda, it would be really important to know which items have to move at that meeting or um, are time sensitive. And so around the budget time, when I did create those extra meetings, that was, I had multiple conversations, um, primarily with the mayor's office, but also with planning about you know, which of these items should we prioritize for this meeting and make sure that they get done and which ones can wait until the, the net next sort of overflow meeting that was scheduled. Um, so that's something to consider. And what else? Um, I know that you, I don't think it's on the agenda, but um, you're also considering uh, the importance or the, the, the necessity of whether of a second reading. So that's something also to, to take into account because of course, if you don't reach something on, a, on an agenda and it gets, you're pushing uh, the second reading even farther. So that might be something uh -huh. to consider um, in terms of whether uh, second readings are really needed or not. Um, and let's see. Oh, one other thing I'd really like people to consider if, if you are thinking about having extra meetings or they're necessitated is, um, Consideration for Laura's time, as well as for other city staff who often wait around for their agenda item and then may have done that waiting without uh, having reached it in that meeting and then we'll have to come to another meeting. But um, specifically, I wanna talk to Laura's time because there were so many meetings this past spring that, um, that Laura actually exceeded the number of allowed comp time hours um, which I think was the first time it happened, and then went into overtime pay. And I'm extremely grateful that she's compensated either by comp time or by overtime pay, but it's just important to be mindful of one, what's a reasonable amount of work for somebody to do, and that every hour of meeting time that we have uh, then creates extra, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the ratio is, but creates probably maybe at least another hour of time for Laura as she has to then uh, process whatever we have done and passed, but additionally doing the minutes, which Laura does a beautiful job of, and, and that takes an extremely long time for her to do. So um, that's something else just to consider is, is the impact on other staff um, for whatever these decisions are that you are making. So that's, thank you for hearing my point of view on that. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, 
Chairperson Mayari is back and I relinquish the gavel to you. We're in public comment. Oh, thank, okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, do we have, let's see, any other hands up? And apologies, the there was a backup at the camp pickup line that was impressive. I don't see any other hands up. Uh, so I don't think there's any more, anyone else here for public comment that I can't see? I don't think so. Okay, how about we move on to approval? Let's see, is that where we are? The approval of the, of the minutes? Mm -hmm. Move yes, approval, approval please. of the July 13th uh, minute. Excuse me. Move approval, please. Second. Roll call, please. Well, uh, a moment. Uh, I actually have a. One of the things I wanted to clarify was during the discussion of uh, where we were talking about enfolding public comment into the body of the meeting, that I had suggested that there. Uh, that was one thing we could do, but there are complications. What I wanted to note was that there were complications associated with that um, and a number of challenges it would present. And if I don't know if we could add that, I was a little more specific, but I think just that vague illusion would be enough to satisfy me. But um, I just, the reason I want that on the public record is that there are concerns with enfolding those and also the consideration and discussion of uh, putting hearings before the, uh, I didn't comment on that though, but putting the hearings before public comment. But because we use these as reference points for us and then re the public uses them as reference points too. So I want at least that dimension of the conversation to be uh, represented, that's all. You so I would- Which page that's on? I just wanna- Okay. That's not, I'm gonna have to look it up on my phone. Let's see. Uh, ba, ba, da, ba, da, na, na, na. Okay. Uh, ba, 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 Looking phone. myself, it, I know you talked about- Your it. notes are so damn thorough, Laura. That's Sorry. Hard. I said, no, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, a, it's uh, hard to summarize some of these things. We're on subcommittees. 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 I'm on the third page now. Oh, no, fourth. Oh, uh, you know what? It, it it must be in response to when Ezekiel was talking about having the public comment associated with the agenda items. It had to be at right. That, you were okay. I as long okay. Now that I'm figuring, I'll I'll find it now. I know okay. where it must be. Um, okay. And and to be honest, I don't care how you represent it. I, okay. I don't, even, I don't even need to be credited. It's just that. A uh, 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 concern was expressed about the process by which it has to be implemented. So that's all. Okay. I'll add something to that fact. Okay. So I, I move approval as amended. Second. Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, let me see. Um, Councilor Maori. Yes. Member Simon. Aye. Member Baskin. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. Um, well, moving on in the agenda. Let's see. Consideration of the modification of the following council rules. Remote. So we're going to continue our remote meeting participation um, subject. I tried to not uh, really load down the agenda today. I'm hoping to, of course, try to keep it to two hours, but. Um, so we can continue that conversation. Anyone want to speak to that? Well, I mean, it's it's interesting because, and I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't wait to be recognized. I'm sorry. The, but it's interesting 
uh, in lieu of uh, Councilor Shera's comments, all, all these things refer to each other. So, um, and we're trying to base a set of rules on an exceptional year, an extraordinary year, which really had no precedent. But, um, and, and as such, we, we run the risk of overcompensating on some level um, for something that might not reoccur. And th this goes to the later discussion about uh, having a drop dead deadline when meetings should end. But the remote participation, of course, adds this the, uh, adds work for staff and it does create um, challenges. But I think the more salient point, of course, is what, what uh, Member Simon referred to, which is, and, and Councilor Foster as well. And I actually, I believe that the entire body, everyone is really pleased with the fact that it's opened up the conversation and, and provided accessibility and participation in, in discussions. And as such, and again, you know, having this conversation is a little tricky because we still don't know what the, the attorney general is going to recommend. I mean, there's going to be a statewide policy that we're trying to, our rules have to be predicated on, on whatever is established under there. So it's, it's tricky to expand the conversation. The one thing that I gleaned from this is the consensus is that we like what remote participation offers, but also, as you note, many of the concerns and complaints about the length of public comment and so on and so forth um, come from the fact that we were in remote participation. If we were meeting in the chambers, there's no way that 700 people would have been able to gather in there and offer their testimony. You know, many people who came from out of town would not participate and other people in the community who wouldn't be able to normally engage. So, I mean, I, as far as I can tell, those are our challenges. Those are the good things and those are the bad things. And it's, it, it really does drive the bulk of our conversation, but I think I'm not confident we can come up with a solution right now, given the fact there's some significant factors that we just, that are out of our control. Um, Vice Chair Simon. I can see everybody. Uh, I actually don't think this is uh, a very complicated issue at all, um, partly because I don't believe that this committee or the council needs to be so specific and detailed in its rules uh, as to the 10 step process, for example, for remote participation. I think, personally, I think it's as simple as us recommending to the council something like the city council will take public comment in person or may include remote participation as the technology allows. Boom, done. And then at the point in time when you want to do it, you will take all those factors into account, but your rules will, will allow you to set up a remote uh, citizen participation because you've said, we will do this. We may do this, it may. The council may do this if the technology allows, and then you can set it up if you want to. Um, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But the rule will be in place that you can do it at the time you want to consider that. That's my suggestion. Councilor Foster. My understanding from reading, um, reading the law is that public comment actually falls outside of our open meeting law. Um, out, out of the, the legislation there that, that we're dealing with. And so we, we can make our own council rules for public comment, but the law, you know, I, I know it's in effect through April, um, allowing remote participation, but that's actually for the members of the body. But that public comment, if I'm understanding it correctly, is something that falls outside of, of open meeting law and is something that we can set our own rules about. So I think we need to expect that there will be changes regarding remote participation you know, in April or probably right up to the deadline again. Um, but I think we can set our own rules for public comment, which fall outside of the remote participation for the members of the body. And in that way, um, I know Northampton Open Media is, is working on the technology to allow for that. Um, 
but in that way, then I, I would um, strongly urge that we that we put it in our rules that public particip public comment can be made in person when meetings are held in person um, or remotely, um, or obviously only remotely when meetings are held remotely. Member Baskin. Yeah, I agree with Councillor Foster. I think that that makes a, a great deal of sense. I think it, I agree that we don't need to outline the 10-step process, um, but I think we should say that we, that council will take comment remotely and in person for in-person meetings moving forward. That's within, it is outside of open meeting law. And then I think the sort of to the rules that were linked today, which are about remote participation for council members, which is the part that's more directly pertains to open meeting law. I do think, I would make a couple of tweaks to it. I think it's like, mm, I'm curious about any counselor may not participate remotely more than six times in a calendar year. That doesn't seem to be particularly in the open meeting law. It says people should participate remotely only when there's a difficulty with participating in person, um, but it doesn't put a limit of number of times. So I would be in favor of removing that limit of number of times. I would also be in favor of adding, if we keep the sort of, factor list, um, adding family illness um, and um, slash family caretaking responsibilities um, to that list of reasons for remote participation. Thank you, uh, Member Baskin. I agree with you. I, I was going to make the same comment about um, adding the child, you know, um, family, family care, caretaking as a, as a reason and looking at a limit, uh, removing the limitation of uh, participating remotely for council members. Councilor Dwight. Um, this goes back to my original caution. If we embed public comment in the body of the meeting as part of within the after roll call, then of course, open meeting law applies and all the regulations apply in that case. So it makes more sense to actually have some, some guidelines and structure if you're going to, this is how the meeting is gonna be conducted. So that's if we choose to do that. Alternately, the, also the attorney general's opinion relative to um, the amount of participation, the quality and type of participation by deliberative body members is subject to change. That's what I'm saying. That will be changing. Um, that's out of our purview. That's not our. That's not our beat. So, um, whatever regulations that the attorney, whatever recommend, we have to wait for the attorney general's recommendations as far as establishing open meeting law conditions. But we can make aspirational claims. I mean, remember when these rules go into effect would be with the next council, which time you know, this is all subject to change. It's also subject to debate on the council floor among other members. So, uh, you know, to member Simon's point, we don't have to be incredibly precise here because, uh, but um, there, there's a parcel of challenges that we can't, we aren't prepared to address right now. That's all. And that, that I, I, I think it's important that we actually do at least define public comment and the ability that or the desire to have some hybrid form available to us um and just and i and i take member simon's point i think that leaving it that vague should be adequate but at the same time i do think there has to be i, I think there has to be a structure that at least the public can have a reasonable expectation about what their participation will can and will be uh Vice Chair Simon. Right, regarding Bill's last point, uh, we covered that at the last meeting. They'll know there's an hour available for public comment and each person gets two minutes, unless the council that night chooses to waive the rules and extend that. So that's part of what you know. Now, how you deliver your comments pertains to this matter here, which is either you're required to show up at an in-person meeting and or you have the ability to do it remotely from your computer just like this, but it's still within the time frame of the limits to public comment, both in totality and from an individual. Uh, Member Baskin. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point in terms of whether comments should be situated within the meeting or not. I did think that Attorney Seawald made some really solid points in the last meeting about the dangers of suspending the rules based on um, who might be up to comment next. Um, and so I think one benefit of keeping public comment outside of the meeting is that the council cannot suspend the rules and extend the time period. In some ways that might be better. And then council could move to have, as we sort of discussed the last time, an additional meeting to hear more comment. Um, but I, I like the idea that that rule can't be suspended, that it's in out, it, we stick to the limit. I think that's very sensible. And I think holding that limit also means that we can take remote comments, can take, make sure you're getting a range of people, the meeting is accessible to a range of people while still keeping it within a time frame that's reasonable. Uh, Councilor Dwight. Um, regardless of how we do this, we need to have rules relative to identifying or qualifying for comment. Um, and I mean, if we don't spend, because it's a public record and people are going on public record, so they should be at least required to identify themselves by name. And that should be in our rules so that whoever's presiding can refer to that. And also, you know, when you state before public comment, we require that you, I mean, we tell them how long they can speak. We re, now we should also say, well, you're required to give us your full name, not your full address. As I said, part of the problem was um, there are people who prefer to remain anonymous because of, uh, it came up specifically because someone was uh, a victim of, of domestic violence who did not want to identify where she lived. And, didn't want to employ her last name and certainly did not want to be seen on camera. So, and that was before we went remote, but we have to settle, I, 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 you know, whatever we come up with, but we at least have to have some directive on how you may, you know, when you step up, you can't identify yourself as MAGA man from, you know, West Hampton. That's, that's not legitimate. And the presiding officer should have the right to say, unless you're prepared to identify yourself for the public record, you can't participate. Okay. Any other comments, um, Councilor Foster? Uh, two thoughts. Um, one, uh, to Member Baskin's point, um, you know, originally the idea, I think of embedding public comment later in the meeting, what one, one issue that had come up was the idea that some of the public hearings, like the poll petition hearings, right? Like National Grid comes at 7.05 for the public hearing and, and we've had nights where it's been 10 o'clock before they get to the hearing. So the idea was, can we have the hearing first? But if we're limiting public comment to one hour, that kind of removes the urgency around, or maybe not the urgency, but the sort of um, need for that. You know, if they know they're going to log on and public comment might be up to an hour or so that that's different than can public comment be three or four hours. So in that way, it makes sense to me the public comment can still happen outside of the convened meeting. Uh, and in that I completely lost my train of thought on the second point. So I'll I'll revisit it. Um, Member Baskin. I wonder also if the public hearings need to be in the convened meeting because the sometimes public hearings are separate than the meeting. So I wonder if the order, in my perfect world, the order would go public hearing, public comment meeting, um, and the, the roll call would take place after public comment. That way the visitors from National Grid or whoever else would go first. I think that that does make the most sense because even if it's an hour of public comment, they're still waiting for up to an hour, which is not ideal. I also wonder if there would be a way to structure agendas so guests from other city departments and city staff members um, would be able to go earlier in the meeting as the council president mentioned in her public comment, um, just because the, I, I can see the issue with having them come on a different day, having to hold sort of two meeting times, but I also think there's an issue with having them have to stay up until 11 or 12 or one or later. Councilor Dwight. Well, the deliberators, once they've convened, they've convened, whether under, under a hearing or under a city council meeting. So, because there has to be a roll call and there has to be, so, and I would defer to the solicitor on this, but I have a feeling that that wouldn't make a difference one way or the other, but um, having the hearings 
it would seem, because we don't just do poll petitions, even though those are generally the hearings that come up the most, but any hearing, there are a number of hearings that were the adjudicating body. And um, it is appropriate, You're, I agree, it is appropriate to have it at cl as close to the time as possible as posted. You look at the planning board, that never happens for folks. If there's something that's really, we, we make all these hearings at seven and 7.05 with the full understanding that that's never going to happen. That's in a perfect world. But the fact is that allows for everyone to assemble. I think this speaks more to Councilor Foster's point as far as the hearings go. I think that's true. That would be more of what it used to be like is that, that after an hour, um, they have a reasonable expectation that that would occur. As for having staff members speak before the, I, I'm not sure I understood, were you saying um, having the staff members speak even before the item comes up on the agenda? No. So, I mean, it, that already exists. The presiding officer can actually make a discretionary decision based on, on who's in attendance. You know, if there's a hot issue that comes way, way down in the agenda, but that's what the public's been talking about, that gets moved right up to the first item to be addressed so that, that no one else has to consider. And, and so what the uh, presiding officer will do is ask the consensus, just a straw poll of the council, and I've never heard an objection. Um, and it's always been moved up and we make accommodations there. So I don't think the, that will be one of the things I wouldn't want to embed in the rules because I think it handcuffs people. <laughs> Um, do to allow the council to actually have the flexibility to address the issues as it's determined by the body at the time seems seems probably it's not if it ain't broke it don't fix it and that that's not one of the broken things I don't think. Uh, Vice Chair Simon, uh, I hate to be that guy. Um, but we're starting to do what we did at the last meeting, which we're bleeding our conversation from one agenda item into other agenda items. And I want, I just want to suggest we, we finish up with the remote participation item before we go to the next thing. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm happy to make a proposed motion on that, on the remote participation, at least in terms of public comment in line with my comments, uh, but I'm, I'm not trying to hog that. So if other people have a way to wrap that up with an action item, or if most people think we can't do an action item to decide that and move on to the next agenda item. Councilor Dwight. Um, I think a proposal is great. Uh, the remote participation clause basically addresses the deliberative portion as we've all noted. And basically, that's up to the attorney general. It's out of our hands. And so that's an easy one. It's just simply say we're abiding by whatever conditions and terms that are established by the attorney general. And then the uh, public's remote participation, I think, as you've said, we more or less identified um, that it should occur. And we may not be clear right now how it should occur or if it can, but based on the technological limitations and then if there are any other legal limitations put on it. But uh, clearly the ambition is to have, uh, make it as accessible and open as possible. But that would be our recommendation. So it's not a rule per se, but it is a recommendation given that we need to remain flexible on this. I think if we make us, if we start getting a little more detailed than is problematic. So point of clarification, Councilor Dwight, are you saying, you know, um, Member Baskin suggested changes to the, at least a Councilor um, participation and, and then we would add as, you know, MGL or as the Attorney General allows to the, to the end of the, uh, the recommendations that Member Baskin proposed? Because that's what I was taking, uh, that, that's what I would, Get well, well, if, if member Baskin's recommendations don't come in conflict with the eventual recommendations of the attorney general, then sure. I don't, I just, what I'm just saying is we don't know what those are yet. Right. So I'm wondering if we could add a phrase that says something like, you know, in, in accordance, you know, to. That's what I'm saying. It says, I, I, I say that remote participation of the deliberative members. Yeah. 
is dictated by state open meeting law and the attorney general. So, and we will abide whatever those, by whatever those regulations and rules are. Ah, so I guess if there's latitude in that, we'll, we'll have to deal with that later. The members of the body can do deal with that as it, as it presents itself. I right. mean, when the next council can actually say, I don't know if they, if, if the attorney general requires you all to wear hats, you, and, but may give you some latitude on that, you can debate that issue. And that's fine. I mean, the rules can be amended as, as, as you go on as, as challenges or whatever present themselves. So. Gotcha. Any other comments or motions? Vice Chair Simon. All right, I'm not trying to jump in front of anybody here, but I didn't see no, I think so. So my proposal as a matter to clear this off our agenda would be to recommend uh, to the city council modification to rule 4.8, which is public comment. Uh, sidebar, we've already made some proposed modifications to that at the last meeting to add that the city council will take public comment in person or by remote participation as the technology allows. Uh, second. I guess, Laura, I guess we could take a roll call. Okay. Um, Councilor Maori. Yes. Member Simon. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Member Baskin. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. Oh, Member Baskin. I would also move to, since we have 4.14 in the rules as they stand right now, I would move to recommend removing 4.14.1.4. Any counselor may not participate remotely more than six times in a calendar year and adding um, to the permissible reasons under 4.14.2, um, family illness or family caretaking. Um, if these rules stay intact, I'd like them to be amended in that way. If they change, they change. A second to that motion. Well, I, can, can I have clarification on the motion? I'm sorry. The, the yeah. motion is to delete, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Delete 4.14.1.4 and add a additional reason under 4.14.2 that is family illness or family caretaking. I mean, I, I would second that again, again, dependent on what the, the, I, I would imagine the attorney general wouldn't have a problem with that, the mm -hmm. current attorney general. And I would suspect that that might hopefully be embedded, but well, that's fine. Actually, I agree to that. I think that's, I, I will second it. And if we approve that and it turns out that the attorney general says differently, then, then, then that's the end of that sad story. But I second. Just, can I ask just a clarification? What's the deleted one again? There's a lot of uh, points in these numbers. Yeah, here. there are. <laughs> um, any counselor may not participate remotely more than six times in a calendar year. What was the number though? 4.14.1.4. There are a lot of points and numbers. My goodness. <laughs> First Got paragraph. It. Thank you. So that's a deletion. And then the other one is a modification is the motion. Um, so I think, I believe it was seconded by Councilor Dwight. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I guess we're ready for a roll call then. Okay. Councilor Maori. Yes. Member Simon. Yes. Member Baskin. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. We're being very efficient. Now we're on to meetings, uh, meeting start and ending times and length. May I ask, may I ask a question? Uh, my assumption is that a public hearing is a separate meeting. Is that how it operates here? It's, it's its own meeting. Except we do have, I guess we have poll petition hearings in the middle of council, Councilor Dwight? 
they, they occur in the body of the meeting, but the separate roll call is made, and then you have to convene and adjourn out of the out of the hearing. So, yes, the hearings are separate, but they're incorporated into the meeting. That, as far as I understand, it's an act of efficiency. That's all. Is that okay? But is that a choice? Is is that a decision of the council as to as to the placement of a public hearing? Yes, uh, the same as embedding the finance committee into the meeting. Yeah, same okay. thing. It's it's it can they can occur as separate meetings. So it seems appropriate to to bring this up then, if we want to talk about lengths of meetings, as one way to deal with the length of a regular city council meeting is to take out things that are regular city council meetings. So you you would have your public hearings maybe an hour before the regular council meeting. And I think I don't know. I think Ezekiel may have brought up the issue of that embedded finance committee in the um, city council at one point. That, that seems like that's another way to shorten a meeting is to, is to have a subcommittee meeting outside of the city council meeting. Dr. White. Um, yeah, that would shorten the meetings. It would make more meetings, however, but the, um, it would shorten the, the council meeting. But as I said, that was my concern originally was we should be cautious because we're responding to an extraordinary circumstance where meetings are going to 3.30. For instance, the budget hearing, that is a separate meeting. That's a budget hearing. However, the distinction was never understood by the public. They thought they were virtually the same thing as a council meeting. And they were, we, it, and the council president in her wisdom this time removed the budget hearing from the, the midst of a council meeting and, and actually made special times for it. But the public didn't know that. They, for the most part, the public didn't know. They, all the meetings were the same. It's same people, same, same issue, one single issue. Um, the only thing that it would do in the hearing part is that the public comment in that case is required to be dedicated. It's not public comment. They're actually witnessing. They're testifying in that case. And those comments would be limited to the item on the agenda, the poll petition, the budget or whatever. As opposed, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be talking about a cherry tree, say, in that would not be the appropriate time to speak to that. So you can actually limit public comment by saying you can only speak to the items on the on this agenda. It's not you, you it actually point in fact, it's not public comment as we know it, it is testimony from the public. Which is splitting hairs, I understand it's complicated. But the the long and the short of what I'm saying is that it um I don't think the meetings will become appreciably shorter ultimately. The one thing about having the finance committee meeting in is it does allow, the idea was to allow, because there's also a separate uh, finance meeting that usually isn't held, but is on the calendar for uh, the finance committee to convene outside of the council. But the idea to have it embedded in the meeting and allows full council participation, which uh, no, uh, that would be a tangent. I'll stay away from that. It allows, but all members to participate because then we come right out of finance and vote on those items. So it it, it, it literally cuts in half the de deliberative discussion time around those items. So while uh, in the context of that meeting, it adds to it, but in the context of the amount of work and deliberative energy invested by staff and by the, the, the counselors, it actually reduces labor in that respect. Member Baskin. I mean, it strikes me it doesn't really function as a committee then. It's like just the council debates it in what is ostensibly the finance committee. And then they debate it again, kind of in the whole council. And then they approve it. I guess my question is, why does there need to be a finance committee then if the meeting is just within the council meeting and the whole council is debating, it just, it doesn't seem like a committee. And in terms of the way this impacts the public, I think that it doesn't, mm, in, we talked about this a little in the last meeting, but if we're trying to show the public that committees are a space for more public participation and engagement, a sort of a different kind of style of meeting than the council meetings and the only visible subcommittee meeting is the finance committee, which doesn't function like that. I think no wonder the public is confused about how committees function and their role in them. So I guess that that feels, that's my feeling on it. 
interesting. I'll, I just want to make, make a comment on that because I was um, thinking about this before the meeting, uh, kind of as someone who's not in the finance committee, but I first started serving a little eye rolling uh, <laughs> since I had three other committees I had to be on and I had to sit through someone else's. But then the truth is, and what, what we've come against, up against, at least in the last, um, I don't know, the last year is that especially complex issues or nuanced issues that go through legislative matters or finance, you know, effectively all the counselors want to be, you know, want to um, be part of the conversation pretty early on. So they understand it and they get, to, they get to hear a full breadth of the debate. And so you'll, so you'll have, you know, uh, counselors voluntarily, you know, listening in or, or commenting at legislative matters and the same with finance. So it's kind of a tricky thing because I, I, I do see that with, um, with the finance committee that it's the conversations I want to hear as someone who's not in it and I don't want to have to repeat for everyone. But that brings up a great point, uh, I would say, about really um, you know, looking at um, the role of committees for counselors. And really, I want to protect uh, the workload of counselors and, and because, uh, yeah, if, if we're going to be serving on, on committees or subcommittees, we should really understand why and it should be the most impactful way. And for Simon and so. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all on board with what Ezekiel said here. And I would say, Bill, the, the logic of your argument is that every subcommittee should be part of a council meeting. Why, why not all of them? Why just finance? And, you know, that's, I don't see how that works, but uh, you got to let your committees be committees. They're subcommittees. And the people who are on the subcommittees ought to be able to then lead discussion and speak intelligently on the items that are then put on the city council agenda. If other members, just like they're available to come and witness this subcommittee, I mean, other members can go to subcommittee meetings and be even more informed if they want to. But I think it's a situation where you actually can't have it all. I mean, if, if you wanna have efficient meetings that do business, um, but don't go too late and allow for public participation, then you've got to clear off some of the items that you are putting into your meetings. Um, and I, you know, that getting back to like having people sit around, well, it's, it takes a personal toll on asking public employees to sit and wait for the appropriate part of the agenda, but it also is running up the cost to the people of the city because their time is compensated, it should be compensated. And so the longer they're waiting around, the, the more compensation they're entitled to. And that's an expense that, that the city council ought to be aware of, that you should be respectful of everybody, your own time, citizens' time, employees' time, and the costs that are associated with all of that. So I think that's why we're actually having a discussion about you know lengths of meeting and stuff is because they, they've, they have gotten too much. They're too big. There's too much in them. And there's room in your structure to handle things outside of these city council meetings so that you can have efficient meetings that do the work they're supposed to do. Um, Councilor Foster. Look at me on mute. Um, you know, I think to return to Councilor Dwight's point from before is that we're in some ways this this rules um, subcommittee we're kind of looking at, at fairly extraordinary times so I'm trying to keep that in my head moving forward. Um, I know that we don't have on the agenda committee structure. Um, that is something that I would like to discuss in a future agenda. Um, and so I know we have length of the meeting and, and start and end time, but I um, am cautious. I'm, I'm not sure if, if we're getting into the weeds outside of um, what the agenda allows for. Um, that said, I, I just want to second Councilor Mayori's point. Um, I similarly uh, struggled with the length of time of the finance committee meetings initially, but um, I, I'm actually very glad to be in it. So I think a larger committee structure and questioning if those financial orders can be handled actually as, as part of the full committee rather than a, than a subcommittee is, that's all I'll say about that. Um, and then the other thing I think just long, well, that's all I'll say about that until it's an agenda item and then I'll have a lot to say about that. Um, but the, I think the, um, the, 
other point is we're talking about, you know, start and end times. Um, I think Councilor Shara's point is, is from earlier is well taken that the items on our agenda are, are, tend to be time sensitive and, and tend to need to be addressed. But I think the some of the structures we're looking at with our rules can actually reduce the length of the meetings. And, you know, we can look at agenda order. There's lots we can do that's going to respect um, city department heads time, um, public hearings, but then also if public comment has just dropped from three, three and a half hours to one hour, that's that right there has shortened our meeting times pretty significantly. Um, so some of our latest meetings were when public comment had gone on for three hours. Um, the other thing that I, I know we'll address later um, in this subcommittee is the idea of the second reading. And so as we're looking for you know, as we're discussing the end time of our meetings, I'm not sure we can separate that out from some of these other tweaks we can make um, to, uh, to shorten our meetings sort of by design. And that I think we can do. Um, while at the same time, I think being very cautious, we don't on the other side, create more meetings um, and more meetings for counselors to attend and city staff to attend. And that like, I personally would, it, would rather attend a five hour meeting than a three hour meeting and a two hour meeting. Um, you know, I, I think that that's actually more efficient because once we get into the meeting, um, you know, sort of conversation goes um, if it's a reasonable agenda. So, and, and the city council president has the step the agenda. So at the same time, you know, if we can by design shorten the meetings to shorter public comment, you know, discussing second reading, uh, maybe committee structures, but at the same time, it's up to the purview of the city council president to say, no, we're not going to tackle this really this week's agenda is not time sensitive and already the agenda is quite long. So we also. Uh, let's see. Um, member, member Dwight, I mean, I'm sorry, Councilor Dwight and then. The, um these are all good points. And the, what the, the, the fact, and, and just to give you a little more background on why the finance committees unfolded, we've already touched on a little bit was because there's, when you talk about zoning and certain financial orders, there are clocks ticking. And in the, the concern there is if you have multiple meetings with multiple staff time, that actually puts a greater demand on staff time because they'd have to be present at both meetings in order to answer questions for the subcommittee and the larger body of the, as a whole over someone who's not in attendance. Um, it, it's not ideal, but the, we've already made tweaks similar to, I mean, for instance, the consent agenda never existed until just a few years ago. All those items had to be voted on. Another thing that uh, in reference to Councilor Foster's points, all excellent points, or, um, our, our roll call votes are not going to be all roll call votes. They're just going to be uh, voice votes, Ex except for financial orders, which will require a roll call vote. But the fact is that that will also cut down a substantive amount of time. I, I think as you find, as we go into the next session, barring another lockdown or anything else, that the, the, the extraordinary amount of time that was invested in our conversation, particularly on just on one issue, would not present itself. It could occur, I wouldn't discount it, but the fact is, is that you don't make rules for the exceptions, you make rules for the conditions as they present themselves in the main. So it is, and another, also another thing to reinforce Councilor Foster's point that when you're the council president, you make the agenda with an eye towards time and timeliness. And Councilor Shara had mentioned this, that Prior to prioritize based on what had ticking clocks. And those were mostly zoning issues and financial orders that had budgetary requirements. They're all, they're all state mandated requirements that we have to meet. And um, the biggest problem on the state side is they box up those clocks and the public never has any access to it. And in fact, the, the deliberators really have access to it, but we try to present the best opportunity to have the most thoughtful deliberation associated with it. That's why it's, that's why the finance committee is embedded in there. It's not, and I agree, it's not ideal, 
it's there are there are drawbacks to be sure but i think but i think we can work with those if it should come to that and i don't think it's that big a time saver ultimately because our biggest charges are generating law ordinances and then um and then making financial decisions and fiduciary decisions that are uh within our within our purview that's it that's uh, you, you'll find, and as the solicitor said, it's we, the bulk of our time, at least has been consumed lately, had nothing to do with what what we have to do with. I mean, what our authority is. So that that's, I, I agree with Councilor Foster. I think at this point, I don't, I wouldn't recommend removing the finance committee meeting out of the, out of the body, main body right now. There is a separate finance committee meeting that's on the schedule, but rarely attended, but that changes during budgetary times. And also as a capital improvement plan starts to be presented, there's opportunities there. So um, I don't know, that would be my recommendation anyway. I think, I think, I think we, with some of the things we've already put into effect and plus conditions as they change will reduce the time spent on council uh, considerably. And unfortunately for the, all the new counselors, that's all you know. That's all you know, that's all you've experienced at this point because that's all you've had the opportunity to. So just saying there are, there are meetings that have ended at 8.30. A dream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's never happened since I've been there. Um, I just wanted to add, so I'm hearing a topic, an agenda topic, which we're keeping a tally on of committee structure. I think I'll, I will take the liberty of adding and committee purpose because I'd like to unpack that at a later date. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So that's uh, that's on our that's added to our list. Vice Chair Simon. I wanted to um, add something on the issue of an, an, a fixed end time to the meeting because I, I do have some personal experience with this. So on the council I served on, our rules during uh, the duration of my service had an 11 p.m. Uh, ending time for meetings. And um, my expectation then uh, is the same as my expectation now as a citizen, which is I expect the city council to finish its agenda. Uh, you shouldn't see a fixed ending time really as an impediment to that, because what happened in my experience and what I expect would happen here is the chairperson, the council president, when 11 o'clock hit, would say, uh, I'll entertain a motion to extend the meeting. And then a motion would be made to extend the meeting for a fixed amount of time, and then you would continue. I'm largely agnostic about whether you should have a time or not. I mean, I'd probably lean on the not, but um, there is one benefit to having a fixed ending time, which is a deadline will drive action. And no deadline lets things potentially just go on and go on and go on. So when we know that we have to finish by a certain time, we're gonna move along. At least some people will be motivated to move along a little bit more quickly than if that end time isn't there. Uh, and, and so I'd offer that as, as the potential upside to that. Um, and that you shouldn't be fearful that everything needs to stop because I would I'd make the assumption that there are gonna be enough council members who will vote to extend the meeting and then you'll finish your agenda and then you'll go home. Member Baskin. I gather that is what happened um, previously, except rather than motions to extend, it was often motions to suspend the rules um, and they would suspend the end time rule. Um, I'm also kind of agnostic as to whether that's useful. I think it, I don't like rules that exist to be suspended, um, but at the same time, maybe there is a help in sort of having that drive. Um, I also think something that I think Councillor Maori brought up before was the idea of pushing the start time a little earlier. I would also be interested in that. I do think a 6.30 start time, you know, it gets things ending a half hour earlier. I think these sort of small changes, changing the, the comment, looking at the structure, or looking at the things that are in the agenda, I'm more in favor of that than just capping the end time, which I don't think is that useful. Um, with that on the roll call votes, which I think is sort of falls in the, the meeting length discussion, um, I know there need to be roll call votes 
because of open meeting law, I'm curious about the additional time they take and also the, maybe this is another agenda topic for another day, but the, I wonder if there would be a way to vote in a similar way to like this, say the state house where people are voting simultaneously rather than in order. Um, just because I'm also curious about the way in which roll call voting allows members to sort of counselors votes to influence other counselors votes. Um, and so I'm, that's maybe an agenda item for later, but I'm curious about that. Uh, so the agenda item would be, just to clarify, um, the, the way we vote, the way, way we vote roll call. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. just want to write it down. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Councillor Dwight. Um, I'm sorry, but I think that's mass general law. Oh. Um, we did that's out of our that's out of our pay grade, but worth looking into. Um, but I, I also relative to the start time and the end time, uh, the council meetings used to convene earlier, and the complaint from from the public was it wasn't the it was, came up in the middle of the dinner hour and made it difficult for them to participate, especially since public comment was in the front. Um, the uh, end time we used to have at 1130 and uh, Ezekiel's right, we would um, we found ourselves moving to suspend rules. I, I think to Al's point that it, it's motivating in some respect. I, I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence of that because I, I, I served for eight years with that deadline and it didn't cut down on the soliloquies. So, but it, so I, I, I'm an agnostic as well, but I just want you to know we've, we've been there and done that and the rules were changed and, and modified because they were considered a problem at the time. I don't, I at the time didn't think they were that big a problem, but there you have it. So, but again- so, Could you clarify what you, I'm curious about this. So you're saying, uh, what, what was the problem that, that people wanted to change when they got rid of the end time? What was the question of how, how often we, we, we'd be forced to suspend rules? You, you suspend uh, debate to suspend the rules because the motion to adjourn is not a debatable motion. And so you'd have to vote on that. There would be an argument or you couldn't have an argument. There would be a divided vote. And then someone have, would have to move to suspend rules to allow continuation of the meeting. It would interrupt the, the gist of the debate, especially if you had your one item away, but you still have to, you still have to, close it out it's it, it became that's it, it wasn't a huge problem it just it, it was um a nudgy problem that's all yeah i can hear that i i wonder uh visiting uh revisiting the rick maori approach um that i brought up i think in the first meeting uh, i i don't feel strongly about it but i organically um I would, I would prefer as a counselor to finish an agenda item and have it related to the agenda item than the, the time. So, uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't speak to what member Simon brought up, which, which is really, we need to finish the agenda. Saving that, if you say, you know, if, if your agenda item um, goes past 11, you don't pick up another agenda item, but you do finish that agenda item without having to vote just because it's 11. That's, um, but my father did as select um, selectman in Harvard. But um, that's just an idea um, for not having to vote, you know, at eleven because it's sounding like counselor what you're saying, Dwight. You're saying that it became the second nature, like second reading, where you're constantly suspending at eleven. It's oh, it's eleven. It's time to vote to suspend, and so that wouldn't be meaningful. Yeah, and and mind you, as I said. That was before we had a consent agenda, it had the structure of a consent agenda, which actually did shorten the length of meetings considerably because those are the, those are the really piddling items. That's not fair. It, that's confirming appointments, you know, yeah. of which you could have up to 30 of them and, uh, and, and allotting uh, taxi licenses. Actually, personally, things that I think that the council has no business presiding over, but the state has dumped this in our lap and then we, you know, we license billiard tables. I mean, I, what's our qualification for that? We used to be, the survey, <laughs> we would appoint the surveyors of hay and coal and, and, uh, and then fence, uh, fence minders, which was absurd. And that was a holdover from old county government, but we didn't even know what they were. 
We yeah. used to point to the town crier. All that stuff's gone. All that stuff's gone now, but there is other stuff that's really kind of silly and is embedded in the consent agenda, but that expedites matters considerably. Because mm. those I, items used to all have to come up one at a time and then receive a vote per item. So. Um, yeah, I inspect uh, horseshoes out here in Ward 7. Isn't that part of what we do? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> yeah, you still you can't you can't tie your horse downtown. By the way, that's still against the law, and women can't drink at a bar in Northampton. Wow. That's against the law as well. I don't, I don't know what to say to that one. That's a whole other meeting, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, that's not us. That's, <laughs> that's state law. So, oh, that's yeah. state law, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so we have two two issues. We've got the the start time, and then we've got the issue of how do we end meetings? If we want to try to put a limitation, what does that look like? Anyone else want to speak? Oh, yeah, member Simon. Yeah, I want to throw more into the mix because this is a, this particular topic's really, there's a, there's a lot of meat on this one, a lot of meat on this bone. So um, a couple other things I wanted to throw out here are first, um, the agenda order. So it, this ties in with having people wait around, having citizens and staff wait around. Um, I think I mentioned at our last meeting that new business currently under the agenda rules is the 16th item to be taken up. Now, a lot of items before that are pro forma and may move with some speed, but 16th, you know, under the wrong set of circumstances is going to be pretty late into the night. So a simple thing that could be done is to readjust that to move new business up early into, into the night, for example, and take the consent agenda, instead of having that at the beginning, move that at the end, right? When you don't need staff around and there's no public comment pertaining to a consent agenda. Uh, the other thing is the question of the readings, the two readings, which are currently in the rules set up to be two votes. Um, and I don't honestly know why you, you want to vote twice on something. I I, I do get a logic of introducing an item at one meeting and voting on it at another. And I mean, I didn't have that in my experience, but I understand a, a, a reasoning behind that so that you uh, officially announce to the public what you're going to be deciding on so that there's time for them, if they're interested, to get some input to the council. Um, and if that is in the actual goal of this two readings, then you can certainly keep that, but have no vote at the first one. So the first reading would be reduced from an introduction, an entire discussion, and a vote to simply an introduction. And then at your second meeting, you will have the discussion and a vote. And so instead of doing it twice, you'll do it maybe one and a quarter times. And that could help reduce uh, meeting times as well. Um, Councillor Dwight. Um, I actually agree on all those points. And in fact, actually is one of been my concern for a while, but however, I'm, I'm a little concerned because that is going to be a separate agenda item. But the, I would just simply say that actually to give a brief description, the reason we're where we are is because of a traditional misunderstanding that became embedded in the rules. And it and that was interpreting what the term reading meant. <laughs> and in fact, we do at this point, we introduce the item and refer it to committee. That's the point of referral. That's where the first item is first introduced and read. And then for now, but for some reason, we, once it comes out of committee, we read it, we do two votes, which is not readings. The second reading, you're absolutely right, Al, is supposed to be the vote. That's the next time the meet because that point it comes back from committee with with possible amendments and that is the final reading of the item and, and then you vote on it. Um, that was the whole purpose of having subcommittees is to have all the deliberative points, and also part of the rules that's in part of is to you can table, you can postpone, or you can have a minority or majority reconsideration. All those items allow you a second bite of the apple should the should the body feel that and avoid the whole silly behavior of, of having a second reading. That would cut down on agenda length to be sure, because 
particularly what happens is these rules, these laws and ordinances come seasonally, but it's basically extended out over a period of several months uh, before someone actually, before a light item becomes law. And the same issue comes up with financial orders. It would, it would definitely create a, a greater economy of, of use of time. And uh, so in that respect, that's sticking to the agenda item. That would make a significant impact on, on the length of the agendas as well. Because you, you have in each meeting, we're voting on items that we've already voted on and we voted, we're voting on new items for the first time. And that's your, it's double dipping. And we all know that's not a healthy way to go. Yeah, I was considering whether this conversation was staying on task, but I do see the relationship to, um, to meeting length. Uh, I, I will say that agenda order is going to be, and we'll end through readings is going to be on, a, um, a, on, a, on our agenda in the future. So we can, but, it's all, but if it's related to time, I think that it is relevant now. And I, now that we're on the subject, um, I wanted to uh, have Councilor Dwight weigh in on one, one, comment I, one comment I have heard about second readings is some residents have told me they like that around budget time, just around the budget. I, because it gives them a chance, I suppose, to you know really see where their counselor's lying and then kind of lobby or, um, but I just was interested in your point of view about that particular well, the, budget the, and sex. Especially relative to the budget. I mean, we have budget hearing. We have budget yeah. hearings relative to each item. So there's that opportunity. There's the opportunity where it's introduced originally on the council floor. And then there's the opportunity at the final reading. The, the budget in particular, as we all noted, has a drop dead deadline, whether we act or not. If we don't act, then the budget passes regardless. So, and there's, you know, we had to adjust the schedule with the new charter to accommodate, and it, we expanded the uh, budgetary process by starting it earlier. So allowing the mayor to make the original presentation of their budget, so the yeah. public and the council has an idea that's early on and then there's many opportunities to have those conversations. Now, in this particular case, um, for instance, we'll say the police budget was presented very early on and, and uh, um, the same thing with the previous year. And you'll recall that the first vote, the first vote was based to support the increase because this is before COVID lockdown and before um, uh, George, the George Floyd uh, the national reaction to the George Floyd murder. And so in, in, in that respect, um, that was how the process would work. And you, if you wanted to, have, if you had any question where your council uh, stood on any particular issue, you have, there, there is time for the counselors not only represent it, but also for them to solicit and hear it on but again, this was rather extraordinary circumstances in the last year and a half, let's say. And I think, you know, if you didn't have an idea where your counselor stood by the time the final vote came, that it's never going to be realized, I don't think. I mean, I think that that was pretty evident. There was plenty of exposure and opportunity for people to understand what people were, what they were struggling with, what they were confident with, where they felt their, the priorities should be. That so insofar as that, I think I, I think there's ample opportunity. It's a question of, and, and let, let me be honest, the public by and large has not been interested in the budget ever, 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 unless there's an item specific. And we've known, you know, from years past, we've had budget hearings where it's crickets. There's nobody, we're literally begging people to come. And we, while at the same time recognizing that it's a horrible experience to sit there and watch us drone on and on about budgetary items so it, it's therein lies the complication and part of the challenge but in, in fact actually the thing is I said before that I was grateful for the fact that we had this many people dedicated devoted to the notion and concept of what the budget should be but I I don't really know I don't think the second reading gives you any edge on that you're still you by the time the vote comes, the vote comes and the vote doesn't change at the second reading by and large. And if you needed it to, there are rules that allow for it to be extended to another vote. Thank you. Uh, Member Baskin. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I, I kind of, I don't think the second, I don't think having two votes is very useful. I do think it's useful to have time to deliberate and process an item and then to vote on it rather than it sort of going through really quickly. I think particularly with the financial orders, the behavior that I've observed, granted mostly in this year, so maybe it's, this is also extraordinary, but is that the, mm, sometimes things come up and the mayor and the, the city staff need the thing to be acted upon quickly. So they push for there to be two readings. So essentially the item is introduced in the same meeting that it is voted through. Um, and I do think that feels somewhat challenging to me as a member of the public. I feel like when it's introduced on the same agenda that it's voted on, it I feel like if I had something to say about it, I wouldn't have time to say it. And I also think that sometimes when counselors ask for more time around that, there's pushback um, in terms of like a, does, a need for that thing to happen really quickly. I do think it feels important that an item is introduced on one day and then is voted on the next time. I don't think there should be two votes, but I think that it's helpful to have that space. And I worry that my only worry about taking away the second reading is that I want to leave it clear that that is the expectation if we want that to be the expectation, because otherwise I worry that everything will just get introduced on the same day it's voted and there'll be no space for it to be reflected. And I know things go to sort of to committee, but because finance is in the same meeting, there's no additional deliberative space for that. Like it's something, is, a financial order is deliberated on and voted on in the same meeting and announced for that meeting. So I don't know, that's not super concrete yet, but. No, I get your point. Um, anyone else wanna speak to, to that or on uh, meeting start times or how to end? And we'll definitely put, so we'll put two readings and agenda order on uh, on the future agenda, just so you know. Uh, Councillor Foster. In trouble on meeting. Um, as far as start times, you know, back at the beginning of our term, this is an issue that had come up um, regarding the potential for starting earlier. And I know my own reasoning and thinking on this has actually evolved fairly significantly. Um, my original concern or thinking about the need to start meetings earlier was to accommodate people who have caregiving responsibilities um, to be able to come and participate in the meetings. Um, honestly, addressing that through public comment um, or through remote public comment um, is a better way to address it. My I, my reasoning starting prior to have starting meetings earlier um, was based in that. Um, and and uh, I do know, as I've set up with constituents, there is a, a joke because like every meeting in Northampton starts at seven o'clock. Um, but I, I'm starting to learn the reason for that, that, um, you know, people, as I have set up meetings with constituents, people have preferred it to be after dinner. And honestly, as a, as a parent to very young kids, um, I heard I was freezing. Thank you. Um, so let me, let me, uh, is that better? Oh, yes. Oh, there we are. We'll do this and then I'll, I'll switch my internet after. Um, so what I was saying was, um, you know, as, a, as a, uh, I joke that every meeting in Northampton starts at seven, but I'm, I'm starting to learn why that is. And that's been often by constituent request as I'm setting up meetings. Um, and as a parent of young kids, the seven o'clock meeting starter, or honestly, even later, allows me to get my kids from school and, you know, have dinner with them and have them off, you know, starting to get ready for bed before a meeting, whereas something earlier, um, I wouldn't be able to pick my kids up from activities or uh, they, they would actually end up being a larger crunch. So that's my long reason on um, meeting start times. I don't have a strong preference, but but my, my thinking has done, definitely evolved. Um, and, and I don't think I would be in favor of a, of a strict end time. I, I would rather pursue that question with how we set up the agenda and our uh, the sort of administrivia of it all rather than than putting an end time on that that um, we would very likely vote um, to surpass in order to finish the agenda. 
Thank you. Um, I just like to chime in. Oh, and then I'll vice chair Simon can go about the meet start time. I hear you and I, you know, it's one of those things that if you're a parent as a counselor or giving public comment, it's really about what stage of development we had this we met with uh, the planning board and someone wanted to start at seven because they have very young kids and wanted to, they could they had time to put them to bed. For me, that's that's not a, that doesn't work very well because um, seven just means uh, you know going later. And I, I I feed my kids a lot earlier. And but I understand it's it's really particular to people's um, people's lives. For me, ultimately, I think. Um, for reverence for the material in front of me, I would like to be as alert as possible. So for me, starting early or even a half hour earlier, I feel like just cognitively and in a very tiring modern day life that we have, I would prefer to meet earlier. But I, I hear what you're saying too. Um, and I wonder how much that's changed over, you know, when, when people wanted it to be seven. Modern life is really, you know, sped up in a lot of ways. I was smiling when talking about dinner because, you know, and dinner's often something very informal and harried and not, you know, not like something that maybe people used to do 20 years ago in terms of sitting down. But in any case, I would, uh, I'm open um, to suggestion, but, but, my, but I still feel like even a half hour earlier would, um, you know, would, would allow the material to be looked at and let less tired eyes, is my opinion. And then I think Vice Chair Simon, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just want to circle back on the ending time because I'm basically hearing no interest in a firm uh, ending date. And I wanted to say that so that we could like sort of, that's gone off the table now, right? We all agree with that. Um, Kenya starting time, I'm again, largely agnostic, but I have in the past always preferred um, 7 p.m. for myself as an elected official when I had children because that gave us an opportunity to have some home time. Um, I would just suggest, and I don't want this to sound harsh, that the convenience of the electeds is less important than the convenience to the citizens. But that's rather unknown, isn't it? What, what the citizens, you know, unless we do a, a straw poll, we don't actually know. Uh, yes, member, uh, excuse me, Councillor Dwight. The, the issue of start time it will never be resolved because we find that uh, historically over time, I mean, the Board of Public Works, when that exists, it used to meet at eight in the morning. Now, mind you, who in the public could have participated in that and never did? It was, it was it, but it, we, we have not found the ideal start time and I don't think any community has because the challenges are manifest among the body at large, the, the citizens. Insofar as changing the earlier time to the seven o'clock time, the, it just was based on the cumulative amount of complaints that were all focused on the fact that it was too early for folks. But as you point out, things have changed. They weren't able to participate remotely before, right? The, 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 those circumstances have all changed. I would defer establishing a different start time now and give it a year and see where things fall, where, uh, and the public never particularly shy about letting you know <laughs> where, where these challenges occur. Your personal, you know, all of our personal challenges. I remember when, when I first started, my kid was two and, um, and it was, and my, my wife is in school full time. And it was, it was, there were times I brought my baby infant to council meetings Aww. so yeah well it was it was not ideal trust me it was not ideal it did certainly rush things along however <laughs> but so it's just it's I, I i think i don't think again this is not something i i, I think is necessary for us to fix at this point i think the subsequent body once things settle down and we understand how, for instance, remote participation works out and everything else. And also with the possible changes that we're proposing, how much pressure it might succeed in reducing time-wise, it may not be an issue uh, or is at least a big an issue. But I, I don't think right now there's a benefit to us changing the start time 
or certainly establishing a, a drop dead stop time too. Any other comments on start and ending or ending uh, times? It sounds like we've had the discussion, but there's no motions to be put forward on this at this point. And by the way, I, I might have mentioned this, but just for the members, you know, we can move to reconsider anything we recommend this early in the, in the process. And if we get to the, you know, towards the end of our duties here at, at the select committee and we kind of have a new view on things, we can move to reconsider those just so you know that. Um, yeah. Oh, Councilor Foster. Hey, let me try. Um, so that's a good point, Council Mayor. I thank you. And so I guess my motion would be not to set a firm end time and to leave the 7 p.m. start time as is with the knowledge that that can be revisited um, either later with this committee or by the next council. I second the motion. Okay, I guess we can roll call it. Okay, um, Councilor Maori. Yes. Member Simon. Yes. Member Baskin. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. So, sounds like the, mo the motion passed. The motion to keep, to not recommend changes to the seven and not recommend a, a, a hard end time has passed. So let's see, we have timeline for completion of work and file and filing report to council. And I know that Vice Chair Simon had some thoughts on this. Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, so it's really two issues, how long it takes us to complete our work and um, when, uh, when we think recommendations should be acted on. And I'll start with that point. I, I think the, I'm guessing the general belief has been that, that we're doing this work for the next council and these will all be recommendations for the next council. Um, but as I thought about that, I thought that that may not be the best way to proceed here for a couple of reasons. Um, first, uh, the new council will be impaneled in for January. And we already know there'll be a fair amount of turnover. There's likely to be a fair amount of turnover onto the council. Um, so people will be coming onto the council who have not been witness or participant in the discussion about uh, the need to revise the rules, the desire to revise the rules and the discussion about a committee being set up to the rules. Uh, they will not have been offered the opportunity to participate or observe like we have a couple council members now are doing. Um, and so they're gonna be in a position of, well, they're just going to accept it. It's probably what's going to happen. You know, here, these are some recommendations by this committee and um, you have to incorporate them into the existing rules and then accept those rules. So when I thought about that, I thought, well, actually it makes more sense that the current council is the one that, that finishes this and presents the new council with a finished set of rules that they can accept or modify on their own because every council can, can change the rules. Um, but this seemed like a better way to proceed because this is where the work is happening is in the current council. Um, and that ties into then the length of time it takes us to finish the work. And I, I also had the feeling that there's a belief that that we would just go on till December and finish. And I thought, well, I'd kind of like to just get the work done. And, you know, I know scheduling is gonna be an issue for all of us, but it didn't seem like a good idea that we like space out our meetings that, um, you know, we lose an, uh, initiative or energy or we forget some of the conversations. Uh, and it seemed to me it would be a better idea for us to proceed as deliberately as our schedules will allow us to do so and to finish all the work and bring it back to the council that has an, an interest and knowledge in what we're doing. So that's why I suggested that this topic be discussed. Councilor Dwight. 
Um, actually, Al, that's, that's what will happen is that these recommendations will go forward to the current council where they will be voted on because this is the charge of this council. The council president who will not be council president next term and nor will I be here at this point, but at that point either. But he was, it is the order of the, uh, to make recommendations to be deliberated and voted on before the, at least at the drop, you know, the latest at the end of this term. Um, because the, what, what happens is when they can, when the new council convenes first day, um, they have to vote on the rules before they, that's part of the convention of the organizational meeting and that's to vote and approve rules. So you're absolutely right to have them debate and deliberate over rules that, that, that there's no reference or contact point, it would makes no sense. So that wouldn't be. And so what will happen is these recommendations will come from us and go before the current council to uh, debate uh, and take the advice or not, and then modify the rules or not based on our recommendations. And those will be the rules that the new council will vote on to approve and then, uh, as noted, there's the opportunity to change them should should someone take real issue with them or there, another problem presents themselves. As you noted, that I mean, the purpose of these rules is basically just to provide uh, a skeletal framework to to allow for the highest functioning deliberative uh, structure for us to you know to work in. And so I and I that's the thing that struck me about this group so far is that every, everyone acknowledging and recognizing what we're trying to do is facilitate public access and transparency, but just as importantly, to create um, the best circumstances under which the council can deliberate and debate and render decisions. And those are the motivating factors here. And I and I haven't seen anyone stray from that. And I, I agree with you absolutely on what you suggested. And I believe that's the way it's playing. It's supposed to play out. Okay, any other comments on, on the timeline for completing our work and delivering our recommendations? Thank you for clarifying, Councilor Dwight. I was wondering about what that would look like at the end of our uh, mission here. Um, as to the timeline, um, our, our priorities issue, our sheet there is expanding as we talk. <laughs> yes. Um, oh. uh, and so I don't know if I, I, I can't at this point make an assessment that would determine the, um, the proper order nor the proper way to proceed yeah. at this point. I, I need to, to actually have an idea. I mean, I, I agree that I think a timeline would be helpful because that type of structure would um, prove to be more efficient, but honestly, I wouldn't know how to shake it together. Right, I hear that. I'm looking at how many, it really depends on the subject matter. I probably could have had a, a lot more to this agenda today, but I was erring on the side of caution. <laughs> So, uh, well, maybe one thing to talk about, which is related is meeting frequency and, well, our next meeting and meeting frequency in general. Does anyone have an opinion on that? Member Baskin. I agree with Member Simon. I think we should meet deliberately and frequently and get the work done so that it can go to the council to be deliberated. So um, yeah, um, Vice Chair Simon. Um, so I probably, I would probably suggest we don't meet any longer than, than two weeks in between, again, as our schedules allow. Um, I certainly don't want to meet like every month. Um, I, I just feel like we can get, I, like, I'm happy with this meeting. We're really moving along and I think we're doing pretty well here. And if we can maintain some momentum, you know, as we, get more specific in our ideas. And there's a topic a little further that I had added here that I think can help us with this. Uh, I think we're gonna move ahead and get the work done um, 
um, very well. Um, but I would probably suggest that we don't go more than two weeks um, if our schedules will allow that. Okay, well, um, any pushback from that? We can endeavor to meet every two weeks is what you're saying, or within two weeks? Is that right, um, Member Simon? Okay. So that said, should we um, look at, get out the calendar? We haven't come up with a regular meeting day yet. And you know, there's a lot of holidays in September. So let's take a look. Well, if you, if you want another meeting this month, yeah, uh, it would have to be the 26th if we're sticking to Thursdays because the 19th is our uh, August meeting for council. Right. We have a 4 p.m. desk meeting on on six. Um, how does August 24th or 25th, any actually any, for me personally, in terms of council work, uh, the only thing I have is that Thursday 4 p.m. desk. Does, how does anyone else uh, think about that that week? I just cannot do the 24th, otherwise it's all open. Okay, so, so we have Monday, August 23rd or Wednesday, the 25th or possibly after NESC on the Thursday. And it can, who cannot do Monday or Wednesday? I can't do Wednesday. Okay. How about that Monday? Monday, Monday, August, Monday, August 23rd. I'm always surprised because between legislative matters and city services, I'm surprised. Uh, Laura, you don't see a meeting, a council meeting that then I don't have one on my calendar. Yeah, that's actually the fourth Monday, so there shouldn't be a meeting. Okay. Right. Right. Okay, great. So shall we say Monday, August 23rd? And does that work for all the council members? And what, what's a good uh, uh, starting time? You want to go back to six? How about you, Councillor Foster? I know you, you're out of office a lot here out in the world except on Mondays, which I have off. Um, oh. So yeah. Um, I'm open to time. So yeah, six works for me. I, I don't know yeah. about the others. Six? six is good for me. Is that? Okay, so six, August 23rd, Monday. And let's, um, great. And let's, um, and we'll, and we're gonna endeavor to be, you know, more, you know, within two weeks or every two weeks. And let's, It'd be great if you can send in at any time, any uh, topics. I think that's the only other thing on the agenda. Was... If, if I may, if eventually we may want to set a regular schedule if that's possible, because that allows the public some level of anticipation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and going from week to week, trying to figure out when the, if, if they're interested, I don't know. And also the same would apply for counselors who are interested. We have. Council of yes. Guard, Council Sherry here, but as well, but you know we're and then and Council Jarrett just showed up. So thinking it, the meeting's convening at six o'clock. I think that's why Councilor Labarge is here and Council Jarrett are both here because they thought the meeting started at six. In point, in fact, oh. I should let you know this started at four thirty. Ah, uh, and wow. there and there is and that that's part of the problem with consistency in time and scheduling. Um, and I'm sure both Councilors uh, Labarge and Jarrett have some thoughts on this. I know they've had thoughts on this because I've, I've, I've heard them say it in public meetings as well. So um, so that's why I think, I think I understand now it's a little tricky, but and all our schedules are, are a jumble, particularly for the summer. But when we go forward, once we start thinking about the September and October meetings that we think about having the same day, same time, so that 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 um, there can be some aspect of expectation that's reasonable. Right, so it sounds like we need to, I mean, the problem we're gonna find with Mondays is that there's a lot of competing committee mem uh, meetings on Mondays, but perhaps what we should do at the next meeting is lay out our schedule with as much consistency as possible for two months or so. Does that make sense? Or, you know, indefinitely. In other words, find, uh, you know, find those days as early as possible. Member Baskin, and then, and then 
think we could also address the scheduling via email because it's not under open meeting law and mm -hmm. that way we could deal with it without having to take meeting time if possible. That's a great idea. So we could discuss trying to find, so we're gonna to try to find two meetings a month basically. I mean, two, yeah, two, two meeting times a month and we'll do that through email. Great idea. I, I, I would recommend something like Doodle Calendar or something like that. Okay. So Laura can see all the available uh, times for everybody. And, and um, this is putting one more task on Laura's plate. Laura. And, but the fact is that that would probably be the most helpful. I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah, Laura. The only thing I was noticing is large. that, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The last meeting was on a Tuesday, July 13th. And I thought that was a date people were commonly available. And I was just wondering, because you guys were wanting to meet every two weeks, did you want to, instead of waiting till the 23rd, go with like this Tuesday the 17th and Tuesday the 31st? So you're kind of starting on a Tuesday, two week schedule. I'm just throwing it out. It's just, it's a, a little three weeks till the 23rd and then not another meeting. Councilor Foster. I uh, love the idea, but I'm going to be off the grid through the end of the day on the 17th. So the idea makes a lot of sense and maybe yeah. we can do that as summer vacations change. Hmm. Right. That, that is a good idea. Yeah. I thought I'd heard that Tuesday was a day people were- Right. Afraid. It does seem like Tuesday are less problematic with um, Mondays, yeah, are very limited. As, it, as I said, I think people schedules become more settled at the end of august yes absolutely so i i think maybe maybe that's when at the next meeting i think hopefully if we do the doodle calendar we'll uh, we'll have a an agreed time schedule and frame at this point okay, okay. that's a, so we'll do that we'll I'll send that out we'll then. revisit that but we'll we'll make sure that people have those times open and uh councilor labarge yes hi um, I'm very sorry that I'm late, but on my paper, it's at six o'clock tonight. I so understand. I'm very sad to hear that it started at 430 because I missed um, some important parts of that. So thank you anyways. Would, would you care to make a comment on the on the agenda items? Yeah, there was an item that I had some great concerns about the meeting start and the ending times. And I came toward the end of what you were talking about. Um, to me, I I've heard so much about it before from counselors about starting earlier because of family and so forth like that and talking about 6.30 or whatever. To me, 6.30 or 7 o'clock is not a problem at all. If we did either the 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, but I do have great concerns about the end in time. So once we get back into talking about this again, I, I would like to talk about that. Because I think it's critical because we did at one point have an ending time. And I think we need to look at that. And we do have suspension of the rules anyways, if we want to do something after 11 o'clock. I am looking at families, counselors with children and so forth like that that we don't run meetings till two o'clock, 3.30 in the morning or whatever. It's just not healthy. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. Uh, Councillor Jarrett, did you, uh, no pressure, but if you wanted to make a comment. Um, I don't think I should because of open meeting law and that this wasn't posted as a full council. Oh, it wasn't posted. That's correct. Okay. So, so we, I was starting to feel a little, a little queasy. So it was. Yeah. Uh, okay. But we're safe with Council Labarge speaking because we're under the quorum. That's yeah. correct. But we starting to understand that. There you go. Gotcha. Right. Uh, any counselor can any counselor could speak under public comment though, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. Because they missed public comment because of the right. posting, I, I was. Yeah. I, just wanted to, I just wanted to understand that. Right. They can all become citizens for public comment, but they couldn't necessarily participate in the meeting. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think that we've uh, hit all of our um, 
hit all of our notes today and we'll be sending in pri priorities continuously as you think of them. Oh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl? Yeah, yes. Just uh, on the agenda item about sending in agenda items, can I just speak to that briefly? Sure. Um, I, I suggested this because uh, I know that in the course of discussions, we come up with some ideas and most likely all of us have some particular things that we think need to be discussed. And, and what I wanted to suggest is that we simply take the time to send through Laura uh, bullet points or paragraphs or whatever you're comfortable with about what topics you want to have as an agenda item um, so that we can get that ahead of time um, rather than sort of developing them on the go uh, in discussion. So we can focus all of our discussion then on the things that people have, have been interested in. That's all. Right. The caveat just being that if I would like members to also feel like they can um, have brainstorms during meetings and, and proposed topics as well. But yes, it would be helpful to have them ahead of time. Um, Member Paskin. Yeah, just on that, it would be, I love this um, list of priorities that was linked in the agenda today and wondered if it would be possible at some point in the near future, Laura, if you could send that list, but with the couple of things that got added on today, and then we could okay. respond and just like highlight or designate top priorities. Sure, hmm. can send out that list. Thank Thanks, you so Laura. much. Yeah. Anything um, else? Yeah. I move that we adjourn. Ooh. Seconded. <laughs> Roll call please, Laura. Um, sure, Councilor Maori. Yes. Member Simon. Yes. Member Baskin. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes.